what happened in the 60 years uh, after Babcock. And uh, so let us see what was there, what has been there, and whether it has led us significantly beyond Babcock. And in the end, I make some remarks on the so-called current paradigm, the flux transfer dynamos, and how well founded they actually are by observations. OK, let's start with the fundamentals uh, until the 50s, which then led also to the foundations of the basic theoretical concepts. Now, many people have been involved there, of course. Uh, there's no possibility to talk about them all, so I'm being very brief here. Of course, you all know that Schwabe uh, discovered the 11-year cycle, uh, but actually there were some conjectures by the Danish Horebo uh, years earlier. Different rotation in latitude was also alluded to by Shiner, but then clearly um, discovered by Carrington, who together with uh, Spörer and uh, the Maunders uh, found the latitude drift of the sunspot zone, which then led to the famous butterfly diagram. Now, when people started to exploit the Zeeman effect, uh, Hale came along and uh, found that sunspots are magnetic after all. And together with Nicholson and Joy, he then found the polarity rules, a 22-year cycle, and the systematic tilt angle of uh, bipolar magnetic regions. During the middle of the century, then Babcock, uh, using the magnetograph, he found the general dipole field of the sun and its reversal in the course of the cycle. So these magnetic observations, they clearly indicate that there is something like a large-scale field underlying solar activity. So it could be proper to use averages in order to describe this. So how did that go? So Lama was the one who first suggested that uh, the solar dynamo, or that the solar magnetic field could be generated by a dynamo. He assumed a kind of an axisymmetric field there. But Cowling showed that such an axisymmetric field cannot be maintained by a dynamo. And so that was somehow of a problem. I mean, in hindsight, it's a bit strange because if you look at the sun, right, and you see the spots and so on, it's nothing like axisymmetric, right? So, um, but still. Uh, again, it was Cowling who found or who suggested this one important piece of all the dynamo models, which is the omega effect. So you create a, polo a toroidal field out of a poloidal field by differential rotation. But how do you maintain how do you generate the poloidal field. And uh, so people already speculated about um, that convection could play a role there. But Babcock and Cowling uh, clearly stated in a review paper, one does not expect an irregular course to build up to give a regular effect. Seems to be a fair statement. But then Jean Packer came along and said, no, there is some regularity after all. And this is being introduced by rotation. And because of the Coriolis force, uh, you get a preferred handedness of the flows. And this is uh, uh, the regularity which is sufficient to let um, a magnetic field being maintained. And then we have the famous Parker loop. So Parker. Uh, was considering small-scale motions, which then statistically, so to say, the effects add up to a large-scale field. Uh, quite independently, Babcock came along, and uh, he looked or he took the systematic tilt of the sunspot groups and uh, suggested that if you have a preferred cancellation of the preceding parts, which are nearer to the equator, over the equator, then you have, uh, and you transport the, uh, an amount of flux of the F parts uh, to the poles, then you create a systematic dipole field. And, and he already alluded that, that this systematic tilt is due to the Coriolis force. So in hindsight, it's a bit strange that Parker, he did not mention the tilt angle in his paper, uh, did really ignore this obvious uh, representation of the effect that he suggested on the surface of the sun. Anyway, uh, 
An important ingredient for this Babcock model then was later added by Bob Layton, thus the flux transport by random walk due to the convective flow patterns, and then it became known as the Babcock Layton model, and Layton also put it in a mathematical form. Uh, independently, again, I think, uh, there was uh, the group in East Germany, Krause, Rädler, and Steinbeck, who uh, looked at something very similar uh, to the Parker loop, uh, and they described it in terms of turbulent theory, and they built a huge mathematical edifice, and uh, they coined the term alpha effect for this uh, crucial reproduction effect for the poloidal field. And that led to this glorious decade in the 70s where you know, all kinds of astrophysical objects of astrophysical systems were being uh, studied in terms of the alpha effect and uh, uh, magnetic fields being generated by mean field dynamo. Well, that ended in the 80s, we'll come to that. But now let's first talk about long-term data sets, which uh, played then an important role in the revival of the babcock layton model, because after, uh, after the alpha effect, the babcock layton model fell into oblivion and was only treated as a kind of historical uh, curiosity. Now, of course, you all know that we have the record of the sunspot numbers, which can be extended uh, into the past by using the cosmogenic isotopes. And um, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about what, what could be behind this. There are various models, nonlinear effects or the intermittent dynamo action. My personal preference are stochastic fluctuations. I can't talk about that today, but uh, there are the references if you're really interested in. Okay, so long-term data sets, uh, um, in addition to the record of the sunspot numbers, there are systematic synoptic sunspot observations there are by various observatories. And then the daily magnetograms, um, which led to this very nice representation, the longitudinal average field uh, you can draw in uh, as a latitude time diagram, and then you see this very nice butterfly diagrams, and also you see the reversals uh, of the polar fields. Now, this was the basis, I think, uh, for the groundbreaking work by Wang and Chile, because uh, they showed uh, by comparing simulations with their uh, with these long-term observations that the evolution of the surface field can be uh, reproduced and is determined by the transport of the emerged flux at the surface by the near surface flows. And you don't need anything else. So, so there is no, so to say, effect from the deeper layers. And uh, you can reproduce uh, the evolution of uh, this longitudinally average magnetic field quite well. And, and this is, of course, an important ingredient of the babcock layton model uh, because it's basically uh, that the high latitude polar fields are being uh, built up by the transport or the preferred transport of F part magnetic flux towards the poles. Now, in a little bit more detail, you can now quantitatively, with this long-term data set, look at the evolution of the polar fields. Uh, here, for uh, you have it until 2010 for the North Pole and the South Pole. I don't know which is which. But anyway, you can extend this uh, now until basically now. And what you see is that the latest data indicate that the Polar fields now in the current minimum are about the same low level as those in the previous minimum. So let's see what that means because we find uh, there is a strong correlation between the polar field in the minimum power, in, the, um, in the minimum time and the strength or the amplitude of the next cycle. 
Uh, you can look at the direct measurements of the polar fields or some kind of proxies, um, but you see a clear correlation. And that, of course, would be, so to say, the prediction of the babcock leighton model, because Babcock and Leighton say, okay, it's the flux which is connected mainly to the polar fields, which is being wound up by differential rotation to create the poloidal editorial field for the next cycle. But this is a correlation. It does not imply causation, right? It could, in principle, well be that uh, the real poloidal field of the dynamo is hidden down there, um, and what we and the polar field uh, and this hidden field is just produced by the same process. But that's not the case, and uh, you can prove that by an amazingly simple mathematical argument, just using uh, the induction equation and some integral theorems. And then you find that you can determine the net flux, the net flux in the hemisphere, just by a, an integration, let's say, yeah, by this integral here, which is an integral in latitude or co-latitude over the differential rotation and the radial surface magnetic field. And this is the main source of the toroidal field in the convection zone. And you can compare, you, you have uh, the observations, of course, and so you can compare this uh, with s s some measure of the toroidal field in the convection zone. You take all the emerged unsigned flux there as a function of time. So let's say if, if, if every field line, so to say, if the toroidal field emerges at least once, then you can compare this and you see it fits quite well. All right, I've already mentioned the correlation of the polar fields during minimum and the strength of the next min, uh, maximum. That was, would be the n plus, I, n plus 1 correlation. So where is the pointer gone? OK. Ah, yeah, here it is. OK. But you can also do it for the previous cycle or cycle n plus 2 and n plus 3. And what you find is that there is no correlation. So the only correlation is with the amplitude of the next cycle, which means that the memory of the whole process is rather short. And so in some sense, each solar cycle is an independent event, right? Eleven. OK, so in the 80s, you had the polver. Uh, there was a discovery of the polar meridional surface flow, which uh, was already suggested could be contribute to the flux transport by Babcock, again, in his 1961 paper. And so there was an alternative, uh, because you have to have a return flow somewhere in the convection zone, which has to be equatorward. So there has to be something uh, there could be a means to transport the toroidal field to low latitudes and reproduce uh, the butterfly diagram um, without recurring to mean field models. And that led to some kind of a revival of the back of the model and later to the so-called flux transport dynamos. Uh, the first of these models uh, was uh, uh, proposed by Wang, Sheely, and Nash in 1991. If the tilt angle has such an importance as basically uh, representing the, uh, the effect which reproduces the poloidal field, then it's interesting to look at this in a little bit more detail. And uh, if you compare the mean tilt angle with the strength of a cycle, and this is here on the lower left, and you find that there's a tendency for a lower tilt angle for stronger cycles. And this is an interesting nonlinear effect in this babcock leighton description, uh, because all the other processes uh, are just linear. But you need a nonlinearity there in order to uh, avoid an exponential increase of the amplitude. So this is 
a nonlinearity, which is possible. There are others. Uh, and uh, recently, that has been looked upon on, uh, on the basis of the individual bipolar regions in a paper by Sha et al. I don't know how really to pronounce that. And they have looked at the tilt angle, or here in the upper right, a factor which is connected to the slope of Joyce law, so the tilt angle as a, fact, as a function of latitude, and this as a function of the, say, flux in a bipolar region. And what they find is if you have a very high flux, oops, no, that shouldn't happen, uh, then you have a decrease of the tilt angle. This would, very, uh, this would fit very well with these uh, overall results uh, that you see in the left-hand side. Also, there's a reduction of the tilt angle scatter uh, as you go to uh, stronger and stronger active regions. Now, let's come to helioseismology, uh, which provided us, I think, deep insights and also deep uh, puzzles. Now, first of all, we have the global helioseismology, and, and a very important result for dynamo theory was that they could determine the depth of the convection zone. And there were big discussions, I remember, in the 70s or so. Do we have a shallow convection zone? Is it only 20 megameters, or is it very deep? And Hank Sprout, in his 1974 model, got it nearly exactly right. And uh, it's amazing uh, that uh, global helioseismology can really determine uh, the depth of the convection zone up to three digits. Right? So, and uh, also a very precise determine of the radial certification. So we have a very good idea now about this overall certification and the depth of the convection zone. In the 80s, there was much discussion about the overshoot layer because uh, there was this paper by Gene Parker that all the flux should emerge very rapidly within a month or so from the convection zone due to magnetic buoyancy. So one needed, one thought that one needed some place to store it. And the idea was to have it in the overshoot layer, which would be stably stratified. And uh, a number of models were proposed. And they all were based on non-local mixing length models of uh, the overshoot. And then uh, Christian Zendalsgaard and co-workers came along and used helioseismology to do an observational test on that. Because all these models, at the bottom of the overshoot layer, they have a steep or an almost a jump of the temperature gradient. And seismology is very good in determining such a gradient or such a jump. And the jump was not found. There was no jump, so there is a smooth transition. And the smooth transition and the best model uh, is one that uh, this is now um, the temperature gradient or the logarithmic temperature gradient. Here we have the convection zone. It's about 0.4 there. It's adiabatic. And then you have a smooth transition over about 20 megameters to the radiative zone. Now already in, in the upper oops already in the uppermost layers of this uh, overshoot layer you have a very strong uh, a very strongly stable situation. So nothing can, it's, it's, it's already like a hard wall, although it's a smooth transition. So all these ideas of you can store the field there, have them in, unstable also, they only work if it's only slightly subadiabatic, but it's strongly subadiabatic. So this is a real problem. Differential rotation I already mentioned. There was one prediction by mean field uh, dynamo theory of the sun. The one prediction was that the rotation rate should increase with depth. And that was clearly refuted by um, helioseismology. And, and the, the basis of this prediction was the direction of the propagation of the dynamo wave or the, uh, to have the right butterfly diagram. And, and that was the reason why then uh, people thought, okay, 
I have the return flow of the, different, uh, of the meridional flow, and this can transport the flux in spite of having the wrong, uh, um, uh, the wrong gradient of the differential rotation. And again, uh, there were more details now. Uh, the, what they found was a near surface shear layer, which has the right gradient, but is not sufficient to create sufficient flux. Um, and on the other hand, you have the rigidly rotating core and a narrow shear layer, the so called Tacho Klein, uh, which would move. Uh, where the rotation rate moves from the differentially rotating convection zone to the rigidly rotating core. Uh, again, of course, uh, people were very excited. Oh, and now we have the strong radial differential rotation. Here we can drive, uh, or here we can produce the toroidal field. You can at most produce a few percent of the net flux. There. And you, need, you have to talk about net flux because you have Hale's polarity rules. So almost all the emerging flux is in one direction. So you have to talk about the net toroidal flux here, and only a few percent you can really produce by um, radial differential rotation. Already with the long-term uh, uh, data sets, um, Howard and Labonte in 1980, they discovered the zonal flows. Uh, perturbation of rotation of a few meters per second, um, which is clearly associated uh, in the lower latitudes with the activity belts, but extends uh, to higher latitudes. So here, that was a clear indication of so-called extended solar cycle, uh, which starts much more earlier already, you could say uh, about, uh, yeah, which starts much more earlier um, than you already see activity uh, appearing in low latitudes. Now, this has an 11-year periodicity, so that is suggesting that it's somehow driven by the magnetic field and not driving the magnetic field. And so it, has, it could be a direct effect of the Lorentz force. It could also be an indirect effect by magnetically driven inflows uh, due to the surface cooling in flash regions. Now, with the seismology, of course, we can look at that also as a function of depth. And uh, also what you see over there is that in the higher layers, you see also a polar branch, which is uh, propagating <coughs> from mid-latitudes to higher latitudes. Now, interestingly, as you go uh, down in depth, then uh, in the deeper parts of the convection zone, this poleward branch is no longer seen. It's just an equatorward branch. In addition, you can also look at the migration in radius now, and uh, you can draw um, radius time diagrams for various latitudes. And what you see there is that in the lower latitudes or near the equator, you find almost no propagation. Then at 30 degrees, you see a downward propagation. But in higher latitudes, you see an upward propagation. I think these are interesting constraints for dynamo models. And, uh, but they haven't, to my knowledge, they haven't been exploited until now. OK, I already mentioned this near surface inflows uh, towards active regions, um, which have been clearly now um, uh, detected by helios helioseismology as well in the upper layers of the convection zone. Now, they, in, um, in addition to driving the zonal flows, they, could, they also would tend to reduce the tilt angle. Right, and so they, they um, uh, that would be at least part of a possible explanation of this dependence of the tilt angle on the strength of the cycle or on the flux of individual active regions. Because the bigger they are, the stronger are their inflows. Um, 
if these inflows of various active regions superpose upon each other, then you expect that you have some kind of meridional cell or meridional flow cells which converge towards the activity belts or towards the center of the activity belts. And interestingly, you can see this even uh, in the motion of sunspots. So in this paper, people have looked at the, all the data uh, from this uh, synoptic charts for dun spots, and they put all the cycles together, and uh, then they determined their, the motion of the spots in latitude direction, and they found this systematic flow here towards the center of the activity belts, which is here indicated by the line. So this is very nice. And of course, Helios of Seismology also sees that and um, sees this also as an extended solar cycle. So here you see these rolls, uh, which are converging towards um, uh, the active latitudes, and you already see here the roles uh, for the next cycle. So cycle 25 will come. Okay, um, now let's go to down to the Tacho climb, uh, because if important things happen there, uh, we should see a significant variation in the course of the solar cycle. And for the last two solar cycles, this has been looked at by Bazu and Antia. And there's almost no variation in the position of the Tachocline, and there's almost no variation or no significant variation in the width of the Tachocline, which is only 1%, 2% or so uh, of the solar radius. It cannot be resolved by Helios Osmology. Right? So if people say it's this and this big, you cannot really say that. You, you, you only have an upper limit in principle. Now, interesting is, is there any variation of the jump of the rotation rate across the Tacho line as a function of time? And do we see any signature of uh, the solar cycle there? And yes, we do. So here are the data from three instruments and uh, from the MDI instrument and from Gong. HMI came later, and here, yes, for cycle 23, you see a clear signature. It's only one, two nanohertz or so. It's, it's, it's not big, but anyway. But now comes the interesting part. If you go to cycle 24, there's nothing, right? So HMI and Gong, they, they don't see this, while MDI seems to indicate an upturn again, but unfortunately the instrument was switched off then in 2011 or when, and so we, we don't know. So this is really confusing and, um, well, uh, confusing again uh, are, the are the meridional flows. You can also try to determine meridional flows uh, in the convection zone. We see them at the surface very clearly. And uh, so there's this big discussion, is this one cell in depth, or is, uh, are there two cells, three cells, whatever. Here are two examples. On the right-hand side, a one-cell flow. On the left-hand side, a two-cell flow. Unfortunately, the color coding is just opposite. So what's red on the left-hand side is blue on the right-hand side. But maybe at some stage, the heliosasmologists would agree to some uh, general color coding. OK, so this is still an open question. It's, of course, uh, extremely important for flux transport dynamos. Um, and last not least, uh, we have the convection conundrum, which is that uh, you can estimate um, the strength of uh, large-scale motions by heliosismology, uh, large-scale convective motions, say, what whatever, 30, 40, 50, 100 megameters or so. And what, the, what you consistently find is that this estimate is orders of magnitude lower than what 
all the numerical simulations give. And it's not clear you can discuss whether it's three orders of magnitude or two orders of magnitude or maybe only one order of magnitude. That's still under discussion, but there is a problem. There is a severe problem with the simulations. And um, that means that we have to take all the results of these uh, 3D global simulations with care. Okay, the last minutes I have, I like to ask myself whether the so-called current paradigm, the flux transport dynamos, how well are they really observationally founded? So the basic idea here, of course, you know, is that, okay, in the, in the upper layer, so to say, you have the babcock Layton process, um, and then this generated uh, poloidal field is somehow transported down to the, um, to the Tacho Klein, and the overshoot layer, whatever there, the toroidal field is being generated by radial differential <coughs> rotation. Well, I've already uh, tried to explain that, that this is not very efficient. But anyway, then it's being transported uh, by the return flow, the deep return flow, if you only have one cell towards the equator. And then uh, magnetic instabilities, magnetic buoyancy then leads to flux emergence. So this is basically the idea here. Now again, let's look, let's ask ourselves, is the Tahoe Klein and the overshoot layer, are they really relevant for the dynamo? I mean, we've already seen there is no really strong cycle variations in the Tahoe Klein rotation. And uh, if the field is really strong, as these models uh, indicate, uh, then the kinetic energy in the differential rotation in the Tacho Klein is comparable to the magnetic energy. So you should see a strong variation of the Tacho Klein uh, rotation, which you don't. Again, it's also a question, because if you eat up all this uh, shear uh, by the magnetic field, of course, you have to maintain the shear somehow. And you cannot do it by just saying, OK, this is fixed uh, uh, by the rigid rotation at the core. And, and so you always have to have some kind of a shear. Uh, that's not true, because this interface to the radiative core cannot support any shear stress. And so um, this does not work. So you, need, you would need a very efficient angular transport mechanism within the convection zone in order to maintain this. And uh, this is not really clear how that should work. Then we can show that the toroidal flux, which is generated by latitudinal differential rotation, is already sufficient to uh, supply the emerged flux. So uh, in principle, you do not need any other source. And uh, as I've also discussed, Helios cosmology indicates a strongly subadiabatic uh, overshoot layer, really strongly subadiabatic, where nothing can penetrate, neither magnetic field nor uh, meridional flow. OK, so my only remark about the stars, because we'll hear much more about this uh, later. Um, if you look at partly and fully convective stars, and if the Tacho Klein and the overshoot layer and things like that should really play an important role, then you should see a clear distinction between partly and fully convective stars. But if you look at uh, the relationship between activity and rotation, so activity here increases on the, uh, on the vertical axis, rotation to the left, and then you see this general pattern. Down here is the sun. It's not a very active star. In red, you have the fully convective stars, which have no uh, overshoot layer, no Tacho Klein. And the open cycles are those which have. And they are basically the same, right? And uh, there also are activity cycles uh, seen, have been seen in, in very cool M dwarfs. All right, uh, 3D simulations, they have their problems with the convection conundrum, but what they clearly show uh, 
is that you can have cyclic evolution more or less comparable to the sun uh, with a dynamo which completely acts within the convection zone. So this is not a showstopper. They also show that you can have super equipartition rising flux loops which are generated in the convection zone proper. You don't need them to be uh, generated and stored in some stable layer. So these are strong indications that uh, you can do it within the convection zone. Um, if you look at the rotation of uh, magnetic structures and compare this with the surface uh, flows or the rotation at the surface, then uh, they always rot rotate somewhat faster than the plasma. Uh, comparable to the range of uh, the uh, rotations in the near surface shear layer. But uh, if it's, it would be anchored deep down here, they should rotate slower. They should rotate more slowly, which is not the case. Um, then you can look at the emergence rates of bipolar magnetic regions as a function of their size or their flux. And over seven orders of magnitude from the very biggest bipolar region to the very smallest bipolar region that you can observe, you find in this emergence rate basically one single power law. Now, these very small active or bipolar regions, they are clearly strongly affected by convection. Uh, you would expect them to be dominated by convection. Maybe there's a strong contribution by the small scale dynamo there. And, uh, but the power law is just the same, which indicates somehow that this is about the same process which is acting there. And that also indicates that convection seems to play in a, a much more important role than we thought, uh, even for the strongest bipolar regions. If you look at the properties of the emergence, uh, if a bipolar region emerges, you have a, a horizontal expansion uh, in, in uh, longitude. And all the thin flux tube simulations, for instance, they indicate because basically because of, cons uh, of the conservation of angular momentum that you have a rather strong asymmetry of the shape of this emerging thin flux tube. And this, of course, is then reflected by an asymmetry in this expansion. Now, if you look at the observations, then um, no such an asymmetry is seen. They emerge perfectly symmetrically. Furthermore, if a flux tube is emerging uh, and, and reaches the upper layers, it has to deflect a lot of material out of its way. And that should lead to an expansion flow, a horizontal expansion flow, already before the actual emergence of the flux. And this has been uh, try to observe, the, uh, there are the observations. This is a location where the flux will uh, emerge in one, two days or so, or three days. And there is barely anything that you could see. Now you could compare this to numerical simulations, so 3D MHD simulations, where you let a flux tube enter from below, and you can determine the velocity with which it rises. So the faster it rises, the more or the stronger have to be these outflows. And uh, so as a function of this rise speed, uh, you see that in the end, if you have uh, an emergence on a rise speed of 500 meters per second at about 20 megameters depth, you see very, very strong outflows. And this is the order of magnitude of the flows which are predicted by the thin flux tube models. This is what you expect, and this is what you get. 
So there's an upper limit of about, say, 70 meters per second or so uh, for the rise speed. And this, again, is consistent with the convective speeds at that depth. OK, I'll go to that. I think I'm done. Uh, I, there, there's a lot missing, right, uh, uh, which I could not talk about. The long-term variability I've only mentioned very briefly. We hear about the observations of other stars. Small-scale dynamo, I think, will be treated by Matthias. The hemispheric asymmetry of activity is a very interesting thing. There's much more to say about the extended cycle or the near-surface shear layer. Um, OK, uh, what do we need to know? We need to know what's the turbulent magnetic diffusivity. Very difficult. Uh, what's the resolution of the convective conundrum? What's the strength of convective pumping in radial and latitudinal direction? That could also uh, contribute to the latitude propagation of the activity belt. What's the structure of the Tacho client? The overshoot? Well, we have some idea by Helios cosmology, but we wish to have no more. Why does the sun rotate solar-like? It's not clear. No? The numerical simulations do not give it. If you let them return, uh, uh, if you let them rotate at one solar rotation, you have an anti-solar differential rotation in latitude. And why does flux emerge in the way it does? And, and the flux emergence is really uh, one of the important unknown ingredients in all of the dynamo models. So I will not give a conclusion myself. I let uh, Gene Parker speak uh, uh, there, in, uh, who made a very poetic and, and a very good statement in 1989. The shifting nuances of observation have many times in the past sunk a substantial theoretical ship. And the most likely explanation of today may be found washed up on the beach tomorrow. Thank you.